I hope that everyone is seeing my screen. Can you just confirm that you are seeing my screen? Yes. Great. Okay. So, hi. Welcome, everyone, to the fourth edition of Product Management Nights Porto. Once again, we are in this virtual setup that even if it's not ideal, it will allow us to share knowledge and experience with our product managers community. Um, I will keep admitting people. As I said, this is not ideal. We still miss our after parties that we did in the first two events that were powerful enablers uh, of networking, community growth. And we hope that soon we can get back to this in-person meet meetup format. As usual, I would like to suggest you once again to keep tuned in our Product Management Nights Instagram, our Meetup channel, and also our YouTube channel, uh, where you can see the last video and you, then you are going to be able to also to see and share this event video. I also suggest you to follow Product Management Festival LinkedIn. Last week, we had another Product Management Festival. Once again, it was a really good opportunity and with great speakers, moderators, and enough time for networking. They turned the remote setup just a small detail. So today, in this event, we are going to focus in the, the designs and how it can help us to build better products. More and more, the designs, artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data is, are part of our products, and we use these technologies and techniques to solve our users and customer problems leveraging the experience and bringing high levels of customization, effectiveness, and others. To understand how should you use those technologies, it's important to know their potential and to understand how, what we can offer, but also understand the risks and the challenges that you're going to face that might impact your product and your business. So this is the context for today. And now I would like to present our speakers. For the first time, we will have a talk with more than one speaker. So, and we are not going to try with two, we are going to try with three. And I know that George, Manuel and Ricardo from Defined Crowd are going to nail it. They will explain us the importance of nurturing teams and people and developing dynamics that make uh, that and making the integration of the designs a success in our products. Then we will have Amen directly from Toronto that accepted our challenge to be here today. Thank you for that. Probably some of you already know Amen uh, because he was a PMF speaker last year. Today, in his talk titled Build for Augmentation, Amin will tell us why product sense is a vital skill to manage products that are solving real human needs and upholding human values. In the end of these two talks, we are going to have Q&A, so feel free to share your questions and comments in the Zoom chat. Feel, feel also free to share thoughts, book suggestions, or to present yourselves and share, for example, your LinkedIn. Um, so on behalf of all team, we would like to thank you for your presence today and hope that you enjoy this event and most importantly, to learn and share. Thank you. So I will now hand over to George, Manuel, and Ricardo from Define Crowd. So welcome, guys. You are seeing my screen, right? George, you need to take over. Ricardo. No. Replacing control. Yeah, I mean, go on. Okay, so starting. As Carlos said, we are trying to tell you our journey towards making data science impacting the most, the, the most as possible our product. Um, we already introduced ourselves so we can skip that part. Um, maybe, no, maybe we can even talk a little bit uh, about ourselves before. Uh, 
Jorge, and this is important because Jorge will give us the product manager perspective. I'll give you the engineering manager perspective and Ricardo will give you the agile coach perspective. Ricardo, the stage is yours now. Okay, thank you, Manuel. I think that I need to request again the control. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's it. Yeah, perfect. Okay, let's change the screen. Okay, so thank you all. Uh, thank you, Manuel, obvious. Uh, and thank you, Carlos, for this kind of opportunity to, to share our thoughts uh, with all these kind of folks. So, okay, guys. So first of all, as Manuel says, uh, we, we want uh, to share with you our journey around uh, how can we empowerment and accelerating data scientists impact in the, uh, wait a few minutes, George, please, <laughs> uh, in the, um, in your product. So it's our uh, thoughts, it's our journey. Take a look and pick what you really think that it's important for your personal journey. Okay, so uh, as you know, all companies these days are investing a lot in data science, ML engineers, data engineers, and all kind of buzzwords that uh, AI brings to, to the markets. But if you go down in the trench, uh, working together with other forces is often uh, a far from a love story, as you know. Uh, it's not easy to put a product manager, engineers, data scientists, ML engineers, uh, all working together. It's a friction between different walls, creating silos, uh, and normally leads to a lower, to slower time to market uh, and growing um, tensions uh, in the organizations. Most people uh, here, uh, and come on guys, uh, let's be honest, uh, already feel it uh, and uh, feel that sometimes people are trying to, to at least one time dislike one another. So data science complain that, that uh, they can get enough time for experimenting and trying uh, more algorithms uh, or product folks feeling that it's not possible to involve product in, uh, in the customer satisfactions faster uh, or even engineers that feel they don't get enough time to build things as a solid as they should want to do it, right? It's a normal point uh, in a normal day. But come on, this is the point that we want to, to, to talk. George, the stage is yours. So hi, everyone again. Do you see, have I changed the style? Ah, yep. okay. <laughs> Sorry. So what, what is our, our business about? If we, if we had to fit it into um, uh, a one-liner, it is simply about creating more natural interactions by voice and natural, natural language between people and devices. Okay, so th this would be, would be the shortest we can say. So we're business to business and our clients are creating things like virtual assistant, chatbots, automatic speech recognition, and so on. All of these have one thing in common. They're, they're continuously hungry for more training data. So imagine you want to expand your product and make it work for a new language or accent. Or imagine you want to improve it and, and beat your competitors to the most natural uh, interaction. Or, um, or, or, or maybe you just wanted to, to keep up with new words and concepts. So, so think, think of this year, uh, new, new words in our lexicons like uh, COVID and, and Corona. So bottom line is the necessity for more and better and better data doesn't ever end. So that's where uh, Define Crowd comes in, uh, offering integration with, with flows for taking care of collecting and reaching and uh, returning to uh, um, return high, high quality data to, to, to customers. And that's it. Hi again. So throughout this presentation, we'll tell you the story and also what we learned on the path of leveraging data science to impact the business. And throughout today's presentation, it will, we will mix this story together with our personal story, our career development, as well as Define Crowd story. Uh, some of you may know, but Define Crowd has been growing at an incredible rate. Um, and for us, it's, an, uh, it's, been, a, it's been an amazing uh, adventure from one employee to more than 300 in four years and a totaling investment of over 16 million US dollars. Me, Ricardo and George joined Define Crowd at different stages of the company. And each one of us since then have been heavily invested in making the data science impact as much as possible in our business. 
And we are going to tell you what we learned throughout the several stages of having data science uh, in different crowd. This is the first stage when the first data scientist arrived to the company. Also in a secondary stage when we had a few data scientists in a centralized team. And finally, when we created product teams that are composed of data scientists, that engineers, front-end engineers, back engineers, you name it, so that they can collaborate towards a common goal. Okay. I'll... So obviously, um, AI being at the core of the business, the data scientists were being hired since nearly the beginning. So. Initially, data science grew as a centralized team. So th this helped converging into um, common technologies, smoother collaboration on research, maintaining findings reproducible and accessible to anyone. Um, so to give you an example, this made us safe from, for instance, people not being able to, to resume, uh, reproduce or trust research done um, by others. Or, or even people leaving the company, like domain experts leaving the company. Uh, overall, you can think of it as acquiring minimal structure so you avoid total chaos in how people do um, data science um, within the organization. So fast forward, fast forward about a year and a half, and this centralized team had grown into um, about six to eight people. As you... Um, as, as you see from the pictures, we were many more than before. <laughs> so <laughs> hiring at a quick pace and, and um, all, all, always hiring at a quick pace and uh, with the organization changing so fast. So also growing expectations and, uh, and um, coordination uh, were harder and harder to, to, to manage over time. So, and, and obviously for, for, for multiple reasons. Um, for once, the, the higher uncertainty and different pace at which data science naturally runs. Uh, another one, so uh, alignment with product strategy can be difficult, uh, especially if the organizational structure uh, doesn't generate enough incentive for it to happen continuously. And maybe the, maybe the worst, in innovation and increments to the product um, can uh, start building up a uh, waiting time on, on queues until other people or teams uh, pick it up, uh, make sense of it, and, and finally uh, build it. Okay, right. so, but after the, uh, the story that George uh, tells us, uh, we started to, to feel some struggling uh, in our people. So we creating a amount of uh, queues of research work, we start to have a lot of people frustrating, uh, and we feel that we need to, to change. So we stop, we stop, uh, literally, we stop doing what we are doing. Uh, and we need to, to uh, and we try to, to iterate on our C-level um, leadership where we try to, to, uh, to impact them with a simple solution. So uh, first, we try to find, to find our own mission. So what we want to build, what we want to, to get for our product. And we define it in a, a simple process. That, that's it. So after that, we join uh, a team, join all the team members that we need to, to think about it. And we started uh, from uh, the beginning. Remember, when we, uh, when we said that we are joining the team, we are joining all the team members that are capable to start one thing and delivering uh, the thing on live. So we have data scientists, machine learning engineers, DevOps guys, engineering, uh, everyone on the same team with same mission. Uh, and uh, at the end of the day, working uh, with same strategy. After we find our strategy, we put uh, the, the the focus on what could be the key differentiator, the quality. This is the impact that we really want, quality in our data sets. Remember, we are a company that sells data. But for that, we need to ma maximize the impact that we, that we uh, uh, create in our products. How can we do it? Reduce the time to market. Well, can you move for the next one? Thank you. Okay, so uh, after that, uh, and after we have a lot of good ideas, we need to put focus. Remember, some companies are creating 
teams of data scientists only to put brand marketing, what that means. Um, so we create data scientists, we go to uh, blog posts or even to the um, newspapers, magazines, blogs, whatever, and tell us, hey, come on, we have a data science team that do a, a lot of data exploration uh, and create a lot of models that giving our output. And we start to create a lot of ideas in the market that uh, AI is something that's incredible uh, difficult. Uh, forget this part. We don't have a data scientist, data scientist uh, for marketing. Please don't do it. Second part is the focus. Please put data sciences uh, and uh, what they really need to do. What is that? Product-driven company, a clear directions. And the team needs to, to well accountable for moving uh, in the business uh, outcomes. Come on, we don't need people to create papers for universities. We don't need, to, we don't need people to create uh, uh, academic uh, collaborations or at least academic papers to publish in some uh, good uh, newspaper. It's important, obvious, and we need to, to give some space for that. But it's not the goal, the, the goal for the team. Focus in uh, what really matters. Obviously, that is a, a phrase that we, uh, well, it's a phrase that a lot of, uh, of you probably know it's about OKRs, but we really to empower these parts. Uh, OK, so, but remember, uh, and to, to resume, Corner's Law, focus in pro products in focus on people. It's the major part of what we really want to, to achieve on this team. Well, next slide, please. OK, so after that, we start with the common discussions, Scrum versus Kanban. Come on, we want to, to decide, take one all, all day to discuss what the pros and cons and try to decide what could be the best framework for the team. Forget this part. The important part is the mindset, shared public and transparency between uh, all the team members. Learning is a part of journey. So issues one, inspect and adapt every single uh, months, weeks, whatever you want to, to do it in terms of uh, iteration and uh, adapt that and change if you need it. We change, we choose Scrum. Why Scrum? Because typically uh, we have a time box time. Uh, so it's simple for us to, uh, to reduce the iterations as soon as we need to, to deliver it. Then we have less time to think, more time to evaluate. Why? Uh, remember, uh, if you have faster teams, we accelerate the productizations, we are getting more value in our companies. Uh, and then we also put some values on that, autonomous team, cross-functional, remember all the guys in the same teams, and at the same time, uh, small teams uh, oriented to product and not to uh, something that is not a goal uh, on the company. Well, next slide, please. Guys, just a quick note. Uh, we test before this session and it was uh, allowed to us to click on the, the, the screen, but now for some reason it's not allowed. Come on, it's the, uh, the typical law that if something is, needs to be wrong, it went. So next one. <laughs> okay, commitments. Um, it's not a rule that we wrote in the stone. Come on, forget this. Uh, again, this is the transparency between team members. So we start with a fertile, um, fertile soil. So, uh, Incentivize that roles uh, is not uh, the purpose. The purpose is delivery products. Uh, so no heroes. All the team is important, and we don't have any captain. Okay, Qu the quality of the organization is dependent of the interactions between ind individuals uh, inside organizations. Uh, second, one piece continuous flows. This is a typical pattern that most of the organizations wants to be, but when you have data scientists, when you have uh, software engineers and ML engineers, forget this part because typically the teams what uh, start to do is assign a, uh, a, a story for research, a story to implement the, the, the sto uh, a story to implement uh, itself the story and another story to deliver the story. It's totally wrong. We put all the team, bring these things down bring the things done by working together on them. Working on too many things at once can radically reduce individual effectiveness and team uh, at least will reduce the productivity for themselves. Uh, and remember, if we reduce the, the amount of work that uh, they are working, we reduce the focus uh, on the team. Team spirit, 
every role actively vote and participate in all kinds of stories. Delivery and discovery needs to be done at the same time. Come on, we have a lot of articles right now saying that we need to do a product discovery at the same time, but normally it's product manager that uh, do the product discovery and the engineers implement that, these kind of product discovery. Totally wrong. When we have data scientists and all kind of um, uh, roles inside the team, we need to do at the same time everything at the same time. So uh, different roles need to be uh, rest together in the same sprint uh, at the same time. And at last, and last one, uh, product discovery. Um, again, all phases is happening at the same time. What, where, the targets, and last, the experiments. All the team needs to think in strategy, define the goals, and help this discovery. If not, come on, it's not, you don't need data scientists, you just need people to, to implement things. George. So after team dynamics, let's, let's talk about validating solutions. So it, it is important to keep in mind that uh, solutions involving analytics, data visualizations, um, or machine learning are no different than any other solutions, that there's still just possible solutions to your problem. Um, so, and in, in that sense, then they can or not be the, the right thing. So we, we, we need to test them uh, and, and test them early and, and keep, on, keep on learning. Um, so, and by testing, what, what, what I mean here is uh, before these things are built, or even before you, you decide, you really decide whether you're going to build it, uh, running cheap solution experiments like concierge, concept testing, or uh, Wizard of Oz are, are great options. So we'll give you a, an example from our, from, from our context of uh, a concierge experiment. And uh, a concierge experiment is about uh, delivering the end result uh, to your uh, client manually. Uh, while it doesn't even look like uh, final yet. Uh, it's, it's really about finding the cheapest way to learn. Uh, any of, uh, of these techniques uh, it is about finding uh, cheap ways to learn. Um, and and the, the, the faster and, and uh, more often you go through learning loops, the, the faster and more often you can adapt uh, direction. Um, so we'll, we'll give you an example from, from our context. Um, so for us, we, we, we sell data sets and data units and the ability to explain data quality is, is key. Long ago, uh, this, was, uh, th this is an actual example of uh, testing concepts and, uh, and algorithms we, we create and created ourselves for uh, extrapolating data set and data unit uh, quality. Uh, we used early wireframes, formulas, plots done uh, a few days ago by data scientists and in interviews and emails. And uh, this enabled us to, to iterate more quickly without the burden of all the details about uh, how it would be built. Even if something seems like a great idea, you, the sooner you, you, you present it to other people, you, you, you start thinking of it um, uh, of how to adapt it or how to optimize, and if, even if it is the, the, the right thing. Um, ah. Okay, um, after uh, George presented a simple research story that was productized, uh, most of you don't think uh, what is the cost for that, but it was one of the first stories that we can uh, be able to productize with and we share value with a simple uh, email, um, we need to, to optimize ourselves, continuous improvement. So uh, we start to do it uh, one thing, probably I didn't mention, but we start with a sprint for uh, four weeks, first one and second one, it was to move to, to the three, but we are not uh, impacting uh, how much did, did we want. So we reduce again the iteration. Why? Because we want people more focused in delivering value. Uh, yes, we don't have uh, the time to do it what we really want, but we did it uh, at least uh, we delivered something for the company. So then we uh, change the scope. Uh, the scope. Uh, we really want normally to, to add more scope in, in each our story. We want to, to, to add more quality. We want to be more smart, but come on, the impact, the, the amount of work that we impact uh, our business, normally it's 
uh, the simple rule, 20% of what we are starting to do it. So after that, uh, remember that um, we have a common part pattern and language uh, in a lot of papers that we have um, in uh, with a lot of good guys that are talking about teams. Teams that finishing uh, early slate more faster your product. So it's not about uh, stress the team. It's not about uh, put more pressure uh, on the team. It's about delivering uh, faster. Okay, no, go ahead. So then, then again, with the, with an example from our context, the the widgets we see, you see on the screen are uh, some examples of formulas and algorithms that we productize over time. Funny thing about uh, these is th these are just letter um, letter versions of uh, what we just showed a couple slides ago. Uh, now they're part of the product in one way or the, or or, the, or another, but. Um, it wouldn't, we, we wouldn't have optimized the concept so fast if we uh, rushed down to, to implementation details um, too early, uh, too early in the game. Okay, as George and Ricardo well said, um, the product direction was validated. So we did all these early experiments and now it was time to iterate faster, reduce scope, um, reduce our time to market. Um, but I believe that you don't only iterate faster by just artificially reduce the iteration length from four weeks to two weeks. You actually need to create a supportive environment around data scientists. As an example, imagine that you want to create a very fancy dashboard with very fancy metrics, but you don't have a self-service data infrastructure. And we faced this problem in the past. So we were taking from research until the actual dashboard with the metrics that were consumed by clients, we were taking 90 days. We passed that to two days after we were able to provide these tools to our data scientists. And once again, it's very important that we ensure that the data scientists have the tools they need to work. Because in my opinion, there is a strong correlation between a sound data infrastructure and enabling data scientists to iterate fast and to be a little bit more specific. And if we re rewind a little bit to the beginning of this story, we had a centralized team. And now after we created all this um, cross disciplinary team with uh, data scientists, engineers, we now realize that that stage where we had a centralized team, it was not all in vain because of course, we are. We were piling up research. We are not prioritizing. We are not impacting the business, but it served a purpose that now is very clear. It was a, a place where we were able to, as data scientists, to develop the best practices as possible, and also to do early investments on that engineering technological stack. So. Maybe at the time the investment seemed a little bit risky, but now it's obvious why we need unified data access to multiple sources of the data that we produced as a company throughout technologies like Jupyter Hub or Superset that underneath have uh, databases optimized for analytical use cases or even um, clusters like Spark for processing large amounts of information. Also, other part was at that early stage, we invested in a, a thing that nowadays makes our time to market to be very low. That was, we always had in mind to make data scientists as autonomous as possible in moving one idea from research into production. So we, from early on, uh, integrated our data engineering platform with our, with the platform that interacts with our actual users. So nowadays it's very easy for a data scientist to do a batch job, in a Jupyter notebook and uh, then schedule a, a trigger to run like every hour to produce metrics that later on are consumed by the platform. One use case, for instance, is we have, uh, so that we can uh, sell data to our clients, we have manual annotators sometimes in the workflow. And some of these uh, annotators are, are good people, fine people. Some of them are malicious, but and even ones that are good people, sometimes they are tired, they are not performing as well. So we need to understand uh, which ones we need to, to put aside of a given um, data collection process. 
So imagine that a data scientists discover a given pattern in the interaction between users and our platform and create a metric or a feature or a model that captures this pattern. So nowadays it's very easy for them to create a bad shop or even a streaming one where they capture this pattern. And every time this pattern happens, we send an event to our platform and this guy is blocked. Also, there is, we also had uh, early investment on having metrics, features, and models as a plugin for our services. So that nowadays data scientists in a couple of weeks can research, iterate, and with very little help from engineers, they just do a sanity check on the scalability of the algorithms, the security, and so on, to put these metrics into production. These were some ideas that in our case enabled fast prototyping. And I would like to reinforce the idea that it's very important not only to put data scientists in your organization, but also to make sure they have all the tools that they need to their, their, their work effectively. And now that's the part where yeah, we, we explained our journey until here, we said, you some uh, things, some ideas, some buzzwords and so on, but you may be thinking, yeah, that's your journey. Uh, my story is different. My organization is different. My conditions are different. Um, but I would like you guys to think, how can I apply some of these ideas to my reality? And I would answer to you that there are two main guidelines. You need to measure two things. First one, is the lead time. So from the time that there is a problem percepted by your client until you solve it, or how fast you satisfy your client, you need to measure it. Because when you have centralized teams of data scientists, what, is, what happens is that someone realizes there's a problem, you send this problem to be solved by a data scientist, and then the data scientist discovers a pattern, he creates a fancy notebook or a fancy artifact. He does a nice presentation to the team. And then this, all this knowledge becomes piling up and is never put into action. So it's very important that we in teams reduce our lead time because a reduced lead time means faster delivery. And the other dimension that you need to measure is how, are, how is the output of your team impacting your business because in the end companies need to make money, right? So going a little bit more in depth, as I said, reduced lead time results in faster delivery. And our goal must always to be uh, must always be to minimize it. And here these are real examples from stories in a cross um, disciplinary uh, team. And this is the example of lead time from these stories throughout the time where we have uh, these values in days and we pass from 150 days to six days from the problem that rising and the solution uh, impacting our product. Nevertheless, keep in mind, and that's why it's two dimensions, not a single dimension, is that faster delivery does not guarantee success. As we all know, uh, we may be iterating frenetically towards a black hole and that does not mean success, right? Um, faster delivery and business impact must be and must come together. Also, business impact with uh, faster delivery does not work also. So once again, they must come together. Now, in terms of business impact, how do you measure it? Well, there is no silver bullets. It depends on your business model, your organization. Some organizations have OKRs, right? Um, maybe you need to understand how can you impact it. Maybe you just have success metrics. Maybe you have a more financial approach and for each initiative, you would like to understand what is the return of investment or to associate yourself with some revenue or some cost reduction, you name it. You need to adapt it to your own reality. So final, finally closing up, uh, final thoughts uh, from us. Um, so pro product direction comes first. So products, so um, 
winning and what is the concept of winning as a as a collective needs to come first and that, well that that is like the the, the role of product so it, it's it's important to keep in mind innovation comes from uh, better understanding what are the problems and and doing things differently not it's not it's not about how complex and sophisticated are the things you're capable of building but about solving the right problems uh, differently and I would say, from my perspective, one might take away that you should take from this presentation is that having data science by itself means nothing, okay? Data science is just another technique, another field of knowledge for you for to be applied. It's just another tool in a toolbox, right? So you need actually to make your data scientist work on the relevant problems for your organization. Data science is not magic, it's just another tool that we need to use towards making a great product. Yeah, totally. And to finalize, guys, um, again, uh, another sound bite, but as Manuel explained uh, in the previous slides, we need to finish early uh, to accelerate faster. What that means, if we finish early our, our uh, research story, our data scientist uh, stories, uh, we are able to accelerate even more faster because we will get feedback from our customers, we will get, get feedback from our models, and we can create uh, more value for our product in the next uh, iterations. It's more than uh, what you can imagine what you can do with that. And as Manuel said, it uh, explain all. Data science is not magic. Uh, it's a way uh, to get more value and a way to impact more your product, guys. Totally. Thank you guys for your time. Um, you can scan here our LinkedIn profiles if you want to reach us out and we are available for questions. Carlos, I don't know if questions are after the yes. next presentation or not. Uh, yes, uh, we, we are going to group the, the, the questions. Uh, so mm -hmm. thank you very much. Um, I, I will now hand over to Amon. Uh, and then in the end, we will have Q&A. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Great presentation, guys. That was awesome. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. All right. All right, Carlos and uh, PMF, thank you so much for having me uh, today. Uh, so uh, today, uh, we're uh, the, the talk that I have uh, is on uh, building for augmentation, uh, which is um, kind of similar to what I had presented at PMF last year. It's a little bit evolved, um, and um, I have a lot more case studies in this one that we can go through together, um, and I kind of adjust it based on the time that we have uh, together. And, uh, and then we can do the Q&A at the end. Um, so I've been lucky enough to uh, be part of different companies that have managed uh, and led and designed uh, really innovative uh, AI powered products during the last uh, uh, quite a while. And uh, being through these different companies from uh, Google Shopify to uh, more smaller companies like uh, Crowdrift to mid-sized companies like CareGuide and uh, marketplaces and uh, seeing how AI and machine learning can uh, improve the, experience, the product experience and empower users to be more effective in what they do. It kind of inspired me to uh, do this talk and also spend a lot of time thinking about it and recently published uh, a book on uh, this called Design for Augmentation, Not Automation, uh, which, is on, uh, which is focusing on how to design and build products that augment human intelligence. And right now, uh, the world is um, evolving and adapting. And uh, during the pandemic that we've been going through um, in, in uh, every country, uh, every corporation, every company, every government, uh, there are, uh, there's a lot of focus on uh, how we can go and automate things that do not require human intervention. And, uh, and a lot of things like e-commerce, 
uh, uh, movements and a lot of different technological changes that you're seeing are uh, are increasing uh, uh, exponentially. And uh, that's because of these uh, events that we're going through and the changes that a lot of companies are thinking about how this is gonna uh, affect them post pandemic and how they're gonna operate. And, um, and one of those things is about automation and how this one time event is leading to rapid changes um, and uh, changing how we uh, do things. And we're seeing a broader shift right now uh, uh, towards automation and artificial intelligence uh, in a way that it's focused on automating what we do day to day and what uh, humans do. And that's because of the, a lot of pressure that the economy is undergoing uh, to have this robotic uh, you know, movement to how can we remove human touch points so in the future and as, as, the, as our you know, uh, tech space and ecosystem evolves, uh, we're not going to be so much dependent on uh, the involvement of humans in this system, which is obviously not the right way of thinking about building products and uh, building, uh, uh, doing the right things and building something that can be uh, impactful. And in this book and in our, this talk that I'm um, uh, giving right now, the focus is really about uh, why and how uh, designing for augmentation can lead to better results than designing for automation and how by designing uh, augmented products, we can actually even get better economical uh, results and better financial results than if you were to design for automation. Now, I won't probably have time to go through all the concepts and everything that I uh, have uh, covered in, in this book. Uh, uh, and I'm gonna go through some of the case studies today, but uh, if you're interested in learning more, I'm um, uh, doing a uh, full presentation on this uh, at Productize uh, next week. So if you're interested in attending, uh, you can uh, use my code to get a 20% discount. Uh, and a lot of other interesting talks by Ken Sandy, former VP of product at Masterclass and some other great speakers. So if you're interested in attending that, uh, uh, you can use my code to get a 20% discount and join uh, next week's conference. So what the first thing that happened to us and the, well, what did kind of what got me really into uh, thinking about this designing for augmentation, not automation was um, our journey and what happened uh, to us at CrowdRiff. So back in 2017, uh, CrowdRiff was just one of the other 16 social media aggregators uh, on the market. So social media aggregators are those products that aggregate uh, content, photos and videos from different social media channels, from Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, and uh, they put it in one place for you, right? So uh, you might be familiar with Hootsuite or uh, some of those other platforms that kind of do the same thing where they aggregate all that content for you in one place. And uh, what we were doing um, at CrowdRiff up until 2017 was that. So uh, we, you know, there were things that the, you know, the, the small differentiators, like, you know, you could post and schedule your posts on uh, Instagram when it was possible back in 2017, uh, or you could label and create folders for your team to work with your visuals. But it was not really, we didn't really have a strong uh, value prop. And that was stopping us from growing, from being able to uh, you know, raise our Series A and also uh, be uh, one of the top players in the, in the space. Um, and at that point, uh, we realized that we need to do things differently and we need to come up with um, a, a better strategy. So uh, I had the, the, the opportunity to work with uh, Dan and Abby, CrowdRip CEO and CTO to uh, really look at uh, what we, where we were at and what we could do to uh, build a product that had a, that could become a world-class uh, product and a market leader. And at that point, what we realized was that we had about 90% of our customers. And at that point, we had about 80, about 92, 89 to 92 uh, clients and, and customers. Um, and we realized that 90% of these people were destination marketing or organizations. Uh, so like uh, Tourism uh, Toronto, uh, Travel San Francisco, uh, Tourism uh, New York City, uh, and, um, and, to, uh, and, and, and why not? And what we realized is that the photos that they're all getting are travel and tourism related photos uh, or videos that they're getting. And uh, we kind of looked into the market, uh, our competitors, what they're doing, what their product is. Um, and interestingly, we found another competitor we had uh, that they try to use artificial intelligence and machine learning to uh, improve their uh, data collection process and data uh, labeling process uh, to kind of create, you know, a unique value proposition that would position them as a market leader, uh, but they, they, they failed big time. 
uh, we didn't get disappointed by that. We didn't. We really, you know, uh, decided to look into it uh, and do our analysis to see why it didn't work for them uh, before saying, oh, well, I guess it doesn't work in this industry, cannot use AI. It's not suited or it's not meant for, uh, you know, uh, AI powered uh, functionalities. Um, so what, what we, when we looked at it, we realized that that competitor, what they did with their AI, uh, you know, powered uh, sort of marketing uh, 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 or functionalities, what they did was, uh, they created an, a, a model that would automatically decide what photos to post on Instagram, Facebook, and uh, Twitter based on the previous photos that, for example, tourism, uh, travel San Francisco had posted on social media. Um, so it was fully automated. It was an auto, uh, full automation uh, of that process. So essentially what they were saying is that, you know, why do we need, you know, we know that travel San Francisco is trying to save money and they don't want to hire a marketing associate or a, a social media a, a publisher to do the publishing for them. We're just going to do a publishing for them based on all the past data they, they have and we know what kind of photos they post, what kind of videos they post. Um, and it failed, it failed because they, you know, the ones that started using it, they hated it and, uh, and they had a really hard time selling it to other uh, people that um, they wanted to sell this uh, to. So what we realized is that the key there was that Automation was not the answer. Uh, humans are still very creative individuals and the creativity that we bring to what we do cannot be replaced by machines and AI. And um, at the end of the day, the way we make decisions, uh, the photo that we posted about, uh, you know, uh, about winter or about uh, the upcoming winter um, uh, back last year might not be, you know, might not relate, might not uh, work this year given that we're going through a pandemic. So what New York City promoted and what uh, was used, the data was used to make a decision on what to post on Instagram or Facebook last year doesn't translate well to this year's post. They probably they don't want to encourage people to go to uh, you know, a, a really populated place uh, with a lot of tourists. They want to have a different strategy in place. Um, and uh, that's just one example, but when it comes down to making those decisions of what to post and what to do, uh, humans uh, are, want to be involved. Now, what we realized is that there was a massive opportunity for us to augment that experience. We knew that, for example, uh, Travel San Francisco, they're getting millions of photos every day posted on social media, and it's impossible for a human being to be able to look at all these photos and find a great user-generated content, a great photo that they can reshare on their social media to promote San Francisco to, uh, and, uh, to, to, to uh, uh, travelers. So what we did, we started uh, using Google Cloud AI back in 2017 and started building the world's first AI-powered visual marketing platform, uh, which was uh, of its, uh, first of its kind for the travel and tourism industry. And that allowed us to uh, become the number one visual marketing platform for uh, destination marketing organizations, DMOs all around the world in 2019. And that allowed us to be able to raise our 11 million Series A uh, uh, despite platform dependencies that we had, which we'll talk about later. Um, and that uh, took us to uh, 720 DMOs in 38 countries. Um, and I mean, you look back in two years ago, we had 90 DMOs in three countries. So just one, a way of, but by just looking at this very critically and thinking how we can augment our core users experience and make them better marketer, better social media strategists, we managed to be able to not only be able to sell to them at a higher rate, but also being able to retain them at a higher rate because we were creating a lot more value for them. And they still they didn't need to fire or let go that marketer or social media strategist. They decided to keep that person but that person uh, was empowered uh, through our technology to be able to do their job a lot be better and more efficiently that they got a lot better results by uh, attracting a lot more travelers to New York City or San Francisco or, uh, or Canada uh, because of the fact that they could now uh, find the photos a lot faster and showcase uh, the best photos of travelers on their social channels. And this was, across, when we looked at it uh, across all of our um, customers, it was incredible. We had about, we had 95 million photos that these people were getting uh, uh, uploaded to Instagram every day. And it did before, it, it was really hard for them to find that right photo to post on social channels. And we augmented uh, their ability to find uh, the right photos every time, which I'll talk about how we did that, uh, to be able to uh, allow them to A, 
remove the inappropriate photos uh, using Google Cloud's uh, uh, API that I'll uh, talk about in a second and removing those inappropriate or irrelevant photos. And then also getting rid of not safe for work and inappropriate content and, and also displaying them for the photos that were relevant to the destination and uh, would, uh, be, that would be likely to post on social channels. Now, when Destination Canada, for example, they go to their social feed, uh, this is what they see, right? Uh, these, are, these are the photos that people post on Instagram with hashtag Canada or hashtag Destination Canada or hashtag I love Canada or hashtag travel to Canada. It's, it's a mess, right? It's, there's no way as a human being, you have to scroll through this like endlessly to find the photos you're looking for. And a humans, that's not a good use of humans time. And that's where AI can come in and be very beneficial by allowing us to filter out what we don't want to see to see what matters and filter out uh, and filter uh, the photos for the photos that uh, Destination Canada is actually likely to be able to use and, and, and leverage. So then they can find a photo like this that is, uh, even though the caption doesn't say Destination Canada, it's just a, a, a Canada's flag, uh, but the image itself has gone through our AI model to okay, determine that this is a great photo of Alberta and, and it should be posted. Now, same thing here that this is a great photo of, uh, of people, two people in Toronto. The caption is completely random, right? Like if you just search for text uh, for to find this photo in Toronto, you probably would not be able to do that. Uh, but again, by passing this through a model uh, that's trained to find the great travel photos, you can still identify these great photos that you can share with your social um, uh, uh, network. Now, the way we did this, we used Google Cloud AI, which again, we didn't want to reinvent the technology. As a small team, if you're a small startup, or even if you're a big corporation and you don't have a data science team yet, it doesn't make sense to hire a data science team to validate an opportunity, then it can be validated by an existing technology. Um, so we use Google Cloud AI. We knew that there were some limitations, right, in terms of what it could do with image recognition. Um, but we, uh, we, it, was, uh, it, was already, it already had 10,000 objects that could be tagged and could be uh, recognized by our model. So what we did, we tagged all these images and it got all the objects in the photo. So again, if in a video, uh, the caption of the video posted on Instagram on the social channel doesn't say anything about you know, goats or animals or why not, uh, the model can still pick that up. So when you're searching for those videos and images, it still shows you that. We also did smart curation. So smart curation is focusing on getting rid of images that are not relevant or are low quality. So that's how we essentially, uh, we use our smart curation model to uh, get rid of any low quality uh, photos that are ever being uploaded. And then we use our intelligence search, uh, which again was built on Google Cloud AI to find and uh, improve the search experience. So on, on Instagram, a, an actual user, a social media strategist or a marketer, they were just searching for, you know, you can, they can search for friends, but then if you search for friends, you know, having brunch downtown, you're not going to get the results you're looking for because it's not looking for specific keywords or the image uh, doesn't do, do an image search for you. So what we did, we allowed our users to be able to do that intelligence, uh, intelligence search and return results based on what are in the photos that they have access to. So that was step one, object detection with vision AI. So we uh, tagged every single photo for uh, travel, San Francisco, or for tourism, Toronto, or for tourism, Canada, or tourism, uh, Switzerland. And we allowed them to be able to uh, uh, upload all of their uh, travel photos that they're getting from Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter to our system. And then we uh, detected all the objects for them through our, that vision AI. Then we allowed them to find similar photos. Again, this is something that we, the technology needs, there needs to be an AI uh, technology to augment users to be, able to be able to do this. Instead of me as a human going through my social feed to find a photo similar to the photo we posted last month about a specific uh, event in our city or a specific restaurant in our city, I can just, we can just rely on similar photos and the way that, 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 the way that we built it, we just compared uh, the, uh, uh, the objects in the photo and also the color contrast of the photo to determine if this might be a similar photo to the photo that you liked or you posted last month. So again, and we uh, extended that ability, again, augmenting uh, our user's experience to be able to find those similar photos. 
And then we did content-based recommendations. Now that we have all these photos tagged and we can also show you similar photos to that photo, now we can also recommend you other types of photos that are similar to the photos that you posted that might not be similar to that photo, but we believe that you would be likely to uh, curate and post on your social channels. And then it gets even more, inter more interesting when then we got into trends. So then we could also tell you about what are these photos that are being posted uh, in your city uh, based on the objects uh, that are in the photo or the video. We could tell you that, for example, or there is an event or is a trend happening related to uh, you know, this specific uh, uh, food or restaurant or event that's happening in your city. So then we, you could also find the trends of what people are posting about in, 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 in Lisbon, in Toronto, or in uh, different cities all around the world. And then we do the same thing again at Care Guide. So with Care Guide, um, again, we the challenges that we ran into, we did strategize a model and what we could do, we never ended up actually being able to build a lot of things I'm about to show you. And, and it's gonna be part of our lessons learned. And the reason for it is uh, a massive amount of technical debt that the team had uh, collected over the years. Uh, in building great data science, uh, uh, data, uh, data related models and ML based uh, products requires great uh, set of data to start with. And if you don't have that, or if you have a lot of technical debt and your engineering team is not set up for success, it's gonna be extremely hard to execute on it and, and bring those into production. So at K-Guide, uh, we uh, were in also in a very competitive landscape. Uh, we had nine uh, competitors in each vertical and we were essentially K uh, Kijiji or uh, Craigslist of care services. And what we wanted to do, we wanted to do a similar approach and use Google Cloud AI <clears throat> to utilize cloud vision, video AI, and cloud talent solution that Google has to transform a product. And, with the and what we wanted to uh, do there was to essentially become the Google for care services. So building the world's first personalized care matching platform. And the way we wanted to do that was uh, for profile photos, we wanted to use auto on um, ML vision to check the quality of the profile photos that are being uploaded. Uh, we wanted to have a video intro for people, but they get at the scale that we were with thousands of listings on each of our 26 marketplaces being posted. Uh, it was impossible to be able to have an actual human reviewing all every video that was being uploaded uh, to the system. So we needed to use auto uh, ML for that as well to check the quality of these videos uh, for any inappropriate content that was being posted. Uh, same thing with ratings. Um, for cloud talent, uh, the, the, the what we strategized and what we uh, prototyped was uh, a, a way for us to be able to search and discover uh, the right person for each job. So then we could rec recommend the right nanny or the right babysitter or the right housekeeper to you based on your preferences. Um, and then using AutoML uh, natural language processing to help our members to be able to write um, their intro paragraph. We realized a lot of our caregivers or nannies and babysitters or uh, housekeepers, English was not the first language. And when it came down to writing their profile descriptions, uh, they were having ch uh, some challenges of writing it and making sure that uh, the, the language is, uh, is, uh, is, is accurate, the grammar is right. So we figured that we can empower them and augment their experience by using AutoML natural language processing model to allow them to be able to uh, add a few information about themselves and then create that intro paragraph about them and who they are. And then with um, uh, Cloud uh, STT, what we did essentially, that was for video intros. Again, we wanted to make sure that these videos are being uploaded, what people are saying in the video doesn't go against our uh, terms of service. Uh, one of the things that we had at Care Guide was that we were monetizing and making money by getting people to be a subscriber of our platform to be able to uh, share the contact information with each other and message each other. So if they share the contact info in the video and said, hey, here's my number, or here's my email address in the video, that would, that would, that would uh, interfere with our business model and how we were uh, making money. So we needed that uh, uh, extra cloud S2 uh, to, uh, to transform uh, the, the, everything that's being said in the, the video to text. So then we could review the text to make sure there's no phone number or there's no email address being shared in the video. So then we could approve it and, and post it on their profile. Again, not something that we could do uh, manually with thousands of listings being posted on, any, uh, every, uh, on all of our 26 marketplaces. And uh, also a recommendation, uh, the recommendation AI that Google has uh, with uh, what we built a prototype around this to uh, help you to find similar caregivers. So if you found a nanny on 
uh, sitter.com, uh, we wanted to enable you next time you come to find another sitter, you would be able to find someone similar to that person if you had a great experience with them and they took great care of your kids. So just to show you how that would look like, uh, for the photos, we realized that one of the challenges we had with our uh, uh, system was that people were uploading these photos like this, group photos. This, we, and we found that there was a strong correlation between people that had only a photo of themselves as a profile photo and getting contacted by families versus the one that had a photo like this. Uh, people like uh, Angelica, they were 45% uh, less likely to get contacted by, uh, by an a, a, by a employer, by a family to hire them as a housekeeper. And the reason for that was that uh, it was a group photo. You don't know who you're hiring. You don't know who each person is the actual person that's going to be a, your housekeeper in, in this photo. So again, by using uh, the, uh, like I mentioned here for the profile photos, uh, auto uh, ML vision, uh, we could uh, identify if this photo was a photo, a group photo or a single photo, and we could give feedback to the caregivers. So I to ask them to upload a different photo for their profile. And also we could uh, look for things like, you know, uh, their expression uh, and uh, sentiment in the photo. Like, are they happy in the photo? Are you angry? We also found a correlation that the angrier the person looks in the photo, the less likely they are to get contacted by families and employers. And also things like, uh, you know, is this uh, something that we should uh, look into? Does it require manual uh, uh, review by our team to make sure the photo is, is appropriate and someone is not uploading, a, a, you know, an inappropriate or um, a, a bad photo to our system? And then uh, people were, were, you know, smart. Uh, people are smart. They know that they didn't want to pay for our system. So they wanted to get around paying to share the contact information and pay for a subscription. So they started uploading, some of the people started uploading a photo of the business card or a photo with their contact information, phone number, email address uh, to get people to contact them. Again, you could use uh, uh, Google's model to identify the text in the image. And if it uh, did entail any phone number or email, we would essentially require a manual review of that profile. So by doing all of these and many other things, uh, again, I just don't have enough time to be able to go through all of them. Uh, we, there were a lot of things that we learned. Uh, the first thing is that we cannot expect machine learning to figure out what problems to solve. As product managers and product leaders, we still have to do that hard work of identifying the right problems to solve. And how well, we can, how well a problem is defined uh, essentially, uh, uh, how well a problem is defined uh, defines how well we can solve the problem. If we don't so define a problem clearly, the solution we're going to come up with uh, is not going to be a great solution. So again, problem discovery and product discovery is still a really important part, a part of what we do, even for building machine learning products. And again, data is everything. If you get a lot of garbage in, you get garbage out. Uh, if the data you're training your models are, are not accurate or they're not properly trained or labeled and your, uh, your uh, data team and your uh, content specialists uh, don't uh, review the data that's being uh, trained and being put into a system, then you're not gonna end up with uh, great products and great models. And like any other product, 80% of the work happens after the first version ships. I, honestly, I think it's 100%. But that your data science teams can get upset if you tell them, you know, 80% of the work happens after the first version ships because data science projects, they're not usually, you know, it takes a lot longer to build these uh, machine learning and AI powered products. Um, but the reality, like any other product, 80% of the work happens after the first version ships, uh, get, getting from, you know, adding new signals and new uh, features to your model, to uh, modifying your model, to even making UI changes to a product that require significant backend uh, and uh, data-related uh, work, it still uh, the, 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 uh, requires a lot of iteration for you to get to product market fit or for your product to get to a level that the users are happy with and they're getting uh, value from. And again, like was mentioned in the previous presentation, I'm a huge uh, believer in uh, faking it uh, uh, with the, uh, your early users and, and, and use Wizard of Oz and uh, Concierge and different methods to, to, to validate the opportunity before, dipping, uh, before going uh, out and fully building a model that might not uh, anyone find, might, no one might uh, find valuable or useful after they use it. And it's really important as product leaders and, and product managers for us to weigh the cost of false positives and false negatives. So from, it's really important to understand the confusion metrics and what each of those states uh, uh, essentially lead to when it comes to the impact on um, 
uh, when it comes to the impact on our users. So this is, you know, uh, in, in machine learning terms, precision and recall, for example, is a really important topic for product leaders and product managers managing data products to understand. Uh, so do we want to maximize the number of right answers and the right uh, signals for a product uh, uh, or do we want to minimize the number of wrong messages or wrong signals that we get? So that's optimizing for recall or precision. So understanding those and understanding how it's going to impact our users and their experience is going to be a it's, it, it makes a huge difference on your end product and what you build. And maybe you're building a product. It's really important to think how AI can or cannot augment the experience. We can build smart. Uh, systems, smart and intelligent systems without using artificial intelligence, without using any machine learning. Uh, thinking of Gmail, the last time you sent an email uh, on, on Gmail, uh, if you mentioned the word attach or attachment in your email, but did not include an attachment, Gmail gives you a heads up like, hey, you said attachment or attach, but you didn't attach anything to your email. Do you uh, want to attach something? Now, yes, Google could use AI or machine learning to do that and they have the resources to do it, but it's an overkill. Uh, you can still build a smart system with a simple uh, rule-based system to look for words like attachment or attaching or attached um, and look for those terms and still give that signal to your users without building a machine learning model that's a lot more expensive to build and it requires a lot more work than a simple rule-based system. And also it's really important to teach your algorithm using the right labels. Again, going back to the travel photos I, I was showing you, uh, I'm probably not the right person. I'm definitely not the right person to define what is a great travel photo and what is a bad travel photo and what is an okay and average travel photo. So when it came to building our label system uh, for recommendation and for content filtering, like I was showing you, we had a content filtering place. Uh, we built a model to define what a great travel photo is and what is not a great travel photo. So if I take a great photo of myself in front of a CN Tower here in Toronto, uh, but the tower behind me is not visible and I'm wearing a Nike shirt, that photo might be a great photo for Nike, but not a great photo for CN Tower because you cannot even see CN Tower or for Tourism Toronto to promote CN Tower to, to travelers. Um, so what we did with our model, we uh, had a content specialist, which I highly recommend you to hire one if you're building a model that requires um, training and modeling and labeling, it's good to have one of your existing team members who is an expert um, uh, or someone who you can hire to be a, your content specialist. And for us, we had someone on the team that uh, uh, she was an expert in finding great travel photos. And she labeled uh, about 10,000 photos uh, and we labeled them as this is a great photo, this is a bad photo. And again, it might be a good photo for Nike, it might be a good photo for a restaurant, just not a great travel photo, not something that a traveler sees on social media, but oh, I gotta go to this place, I gotta travel to this place. Um, so it's really important to use uh, to have that kind of a person on the team and, and teach your algorithm using the right labels. And machine learning is a creative process. Again, it's not, you know, we do it once, it's, just, it's done like any other product management uh, uh, concept. It requires building, measuring, and learning and iteration. And after you do it, iterate it multiple times and, and use your creativity to, to adjust the right uh, uh, you know, parameters and, and fine tune your model, then finally you can get to a point that you have a great model and a great uh, uh, process in place. And machine learning, again, is not just for engineers. Everyone needs to get involved. Um, if you leave it up to your machine learning engineers and your data science teams, uh, there is going to be a gap in uh, the, the knowledge that they may need from your customers, their needs, their uh, problems, and also uh, the, the, uh, the access to data related to uh, how it's going to affect your business. Again, back to that, weighing the cost of uh, false positives and uh, and, and, and your confusion metrics, it's really important for product managers to be involved in the process and, dis and deciding, making the decisions of how, what are we optimizing for and how is this gonna affect the entire business and our customers. And again, last but not least, it's really important for everyone. And so it's definitely easier said than done to fall in love with your problem, not the AI algorithm or the solution that we have. It's really easy once you have a model that's working so well, it's like 99% accurate, uh, it's just working really well, um, and you want forcing to, uh, to, for your users to use it, then you're not solving an actual problem. So always, always, always go back to the problem, and that's what we, we learned uh, uh, you know, along the way. So it's so easy to fall in love with the solutions that you have and the AI algorithms that you have, especially when some of these projects can take up to six months to build, uh, like I recommend 
recommendation engine, like a custom recommendation engine. And so it's really important that uh, always, always, always go back to a problem at any point when you're trying to refine your system and build your models to really, really uh, get a line on a problem and make sure that the AI model is solving a meaningful problem. Again, sorry, it was a lot to cover. Didn't get through everything, but I'm doing a, a longer version of this at uh, Productize uh, next week. So I would love to see you all there if you uh, like to join. Uh, and uh, thank you for having me today. Thank you, Amin. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. And also, thank you, uh, George, Manuel, and Ricardo. So let's jump to uh, the q and I know that we already have a question. Uh, yeah, I, I, I suggested you have more uh, in order to, to keep the pace and, and we have uh, we continue this session. So the first question is uh, for the defined crowd gang. Um, do you guys have centralized data engineering team for the overall data platform architecture and evolution or are data engineers sliced across the different products, mission, outcome or the teams? Uh, thank you, Gustav, for the question. It's a great question. And we are not a gang. Come on. Um, my answer is both. And actually, this is a very interesting question because if we look at the history of our company, we started as a centralized team. And we started having uh, only data scientists and then some engineers joined. But then we realized that the early investment that we were doing in the data engineering infrastructure caused mainly to create silos inside the team. So you actually had some engineers with a completely different mission inserted in the centralized team. So we decided that it was time to split these guys because actually these guys had a different mission. The mission of these guys is to create tools for every people in the company, not only data scientists. Data scientists are the first customers, but later on, even a guy that is not that knowledgeable in terms of technology should be able to use the tools from these people to assess all the data that we produce as a, as a company and by themselves without having to ask help from engineer, uh, find patterns on the data, do quick uh, queries and empower all the people. So when this happened, so we created the data infrastructure team that was building this infrastructure. But still, at the same time, we kept some data engineers in this team working with data scientists. So we starting, started having both. So data engineers fully focused on creating infrastructure and the tools that later on would be used by these data scientists and data engineers in these teams oriented to product goals. This way, uh, you have two kinds of data engineers. And here at Define Crowd, we call them data infrastructure engineers, the ones that are more uh, creating the tools for other engineers and data scientists to use. And we also call the other data engineers the data science engineers, that are the data engineers that are working together with data scientists. And their job is to, as fast as possible, make the research a reality. So they collaborate with data scientists. They review uh, the pull requests from data scientists. Data scientists work uh, in pair with them. Um, so I hope I answered your question. And summing up, we have both. Um, they serve different purposes. Yeah, and just to, to add more, more insights, uh, one of the purpose of, of uh, the journeys that we, we present in the, the past slides, it's the same. We want to do a journey also with this kind of uh, um, centralized data engineering team. We know that we need to center all, all the, the data that we generate uh, in the same place, but we also need to, to create uh, teams that are um, oriented to, 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 to a product. It's a path. It's not simple. Uh, if you take a look on the market, a lot of companies have this kind of, of, of team centralized, uh, but we want to do a, a journey because right now, for example, we have a lot of demand uh, in the knowledge of, uh, of that exploration uh, and we need to, to share all the knowledge around the, the company. So yeah, right now we have this, but the, the purpose uh, in the future, as Manuel said, um, is to move to a different 
uh, ideas, put uh, product outcomes uh, oriented uh, our our teams and uh, cross the, the line to have all the company oriented uh, at, uh, at the customer. Thank you. Uh, considering that we don't have any other question, I mean, do you want also to comment this question? How do you work uh, in your setup, current setup, or previous experiences you had? Yeah, for sure, uh, for sure. Uh, so yeah, it's been like right now we are not uh, quite working on um, any uh, specific uh, data science uh, projects, but at uh, Kerrit and CrowdRiff, uh, yeah, it was a little bit different. Like we didn't have the luxury of having a data science team, like we did at Shopify or Google uh, for uh, for uh, for Google Docs or for Shopify App Store. Um, so for those startups, it was really uh, we didn't have a data data scientist on the team. So like our engineering team took on uh, all the ML models and uh, building models and uh, bring them to production. Uh, and we heavily again relied on. Uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a I'm a huge believer in that there's no reason to innovate unless it's necessary. Uh, so if uh, we can uh, use existing technologies uh, like Google Cloud, um, is, they're, they're doing amazing work right now with uh, uh, the endpoints that they have and uh, what they've done with their models and, um, uh, and why not. So most of those things never really, uh, the, the only uh, custom data model that we ended up building for our um, data science project uh, with our data scientists we hired uh, at, at the end, uh, when I was a cloud rift was uh, for the a recommendation model, which we had to use random forest to uh, build a model for building a custom recommendation system for the travel industry. Um, and I was that was that was definitely it, it was a long project. It took a six month to set it up, um, and then uh, go, going from you know having everything uh, written in uh, Python to getting it uh, into we were using Go as a backend system at cloud rift to. Uh, getting into production and making sure all the models work as expected. Um, there definitely was a lot of challenges there. So that when we did that, definitely appreciated how easy it was to use Google Cloud versus building your own custom um, machine learning models. Uh, but uh, and and the, the other thing there is uh, with a lot of uh, uh, startups, the challenges that startups face is uh, data collection and and having enough data to be able to train your model. Uh, for our recommendation system, one of the challenges we had was. Uh, we had to train, we needed to have enough training and uh, also uh, enough uh, data to be able to build a model that did perform reasonably well in production. And uh, we could not use, you know, Google's existing uh, data set that they've been uh, training and have 10,000 objects already built and modeled. Uh, so for our travel model, we were, uh, one of the challenges that we faced at, at CrowdRift, I'm sure like those of you who were in the social space, social media space, uh, uh, face as well was back in 2018 when, uh, or 2019, I guess, uh, when Facebook decided to uh, remove the location uh, uh, from their API. The location endpoint was completely removed from Facebook's and Instagram's API. Um, and a lot of our uh, models were built uh, using that as a strong signal. So when you post a photo uh, on Facebook or Instagram, and you tag the location, like you're in a specific restaurant or a bar or at a specific um, attraction before we could get that data uh, through their API. And then that was one of the signals that we use uh, and one of the features we use to train our model. Uh, but then once they removed that, that also affected us in such a massive uh, way, because again, we didn't have any other way of knowing what the location of that photo was. Um, um, and one way that Google, for example, solves that problem uh, they already have data around uh, what these uh, like famous monuments or specific places are. So they know the name of the location of a specific place in Toronto, like CN Tower or specific monuments all around the world. Uh, but uh, we didn't have that luxury as a startup. So um, there are challenges. Like it's, 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 it's a lot, I would say it's a lot easier to do these things at bigger corporations like Shopify and Google than it is at a startup when you don't have, um, you don't have the luxury of having that kind of data sets. Yeah, it depends on the scale, it depends on the problem that you're solving. Um, some problems are more complex and probably demand totally. different structures. Uh, I think everyone agrees that being outcome focused should be the, always the goal, um, but there are different ways to achieve that. What I'm okay, uh, looks like that we don't have any other question. So it's time to end our event. Uh, hope that everyone enjoyed. Uh, I enjoyed for myself. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for all our speakers today. Uh, and see you soon. Bye.
Thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you, Carlos. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.